Okay, we're back. Everybody hear me okay? Yeah. All right. Fine. Well, hey, welcome to the SFFCon panel on AI, cybernetics, and robotics. Uh, I'm James Aaron. I'm moderating today, and I'm very fortunate to have a really exciting group of authors to, to talk about this. So um, we've got about 50 minutes to talk, and if we get anyone sharing comments, we, we should have time to get to questions um, at the end. So please write those in the comments, and if we can't, go to sffcon.com and check out the Discord channel because there'll be other folks talking about things in Discord and you can keep the, the conversation going. So Mallory, why don't we start with you? Could you give us a short intro? Sure. My name is Mallory Cooper and I'm a science fiction author. I created what we call the Aeon 14 universe and we currently have about 105 books in there and a very large uh, theme in the universe is how are humanity and humanity's heirs, which are AIs, basically going to get along. And then a lot of it also has to do with post-humanism too, how human bodies get upgraded, how it, in the future that I write about, basically everybody looks at, will, will be considered a cyborg by today's standards and whatnot. So it's sort of a mixture of all those different themes and how they're going to play out. Great. Let's see. I think Carolyn, do you mind going next? Um, so my name is Carolyn Gockel. I write under the name C. Gockel, and I have a science fiction series called The Archangel Project. I'm up to nine books now, and um, in my universe, like Mallory's, um, actually almost everyone is a cyborg, and there, but there are some holdouts, some people who don't believe that becoming a cyborg is desirable, and um, it's, it's almost a religious a religious, uh, it, but it is a religious um, feeling. And there are some people who can't become cyborgs because of genetic flukes. And um, I also have AI in the story. It's it's actually, I think the AI are more, inf are more influenced by um, modern uh, knowledge of how the brain works than by any particular um, AI I've seen in fiction. Okay. Rick, you mind jumping in? I'm Rick Partlow. I write science fiction, uh, mostly military science fiction, some space opera. I make uh, pretty extensive use of uh, AI and cybernetics in them. Um, one of my earliest successful books was Glory Boy, which is predicated on the idea of what it means to be human after you've been cybernetically augmented to the point where you're basically superhuman and how you can fit back in with the, your family, your friends, the people you left behind after that. I uh, also deal extensively with AI and the Interstellar Bounty Hunter series where one of the main characters is an AI. Uh, so I've, I've gone heavily into cybernetics and human augmentation and uh, AI a little less so, but it's still there. All right. And Yudha Hanjaya. Um, hi, my name is Yudanje. I you can call me Yudha. It's, it's a long name, even my Sri Lankan okay. descendants. I write science fiction, um, <laughs> of course, and um, I've been doing a lot of thinking around uh, around AI. A lot of my books are constructed around uh, systems, particularly drawn from the experience I have as a data scientist, uh, and that quite a lot of this is what I do for a living. So I've written for um, I've got a couple of books out. Nothing as prolific as uh, as Rick and Maori. Uh, Numbercast examined uh, how you might use artificial intelligence um, and big data to uh, metricize human social influence. Um, my stories for Slate explore how one might construct a, a perfectly responsive democracy run by an artificial intelligence that can impute the needs of its population and dynamically sort of re-roll a constitution um, every week. Uh, and also the problems and the, and, and the people at the edges. Um, and my latest book, The Salvage Crew, is, uh, is about an AI that uh, is basically uh, an uploaded human on a, on a you know, backwater planet trying to uh, get a salvage uh, job done with a couple of, you know, a couple of humans that it really does not like, uh, but has been assigned to it. Um, and in this, um, it makes contact. There's, there's a whole theory of intelligence there based around how other artificial intelligences might perceive 
the structures of life as you know it. Um, but the important thing, so that book was narrated by Nathan Fillion. Um, the important thing there was I was exploring whether we could use AI as a creative tool as well, because the standard narrative is, of course, that AI is sort of taking over the world. And inspired by chess master Gary Kasparov, uh, I worked with a set of tools that I developed for this book, including OpenAI Tech. So part of the book is quite literally, it is a, it is a fictional AI that is powered by a real life AI. The poetry and parts of the book, the planets, all of that are generated by programmatic tools. And so that's, that's sort, of, sort of what I do. That's exciting. So it sounds like we've got a broad um, kind of scope of what of approaching AI in fiction. And I'm wondering as you, as we began to uh, think about this and how to portray it and Mallory, if you could start maybe, because I know that AI was very important to AI 14 <clears throat> and 105 books in now, how, how did you want to portray AI when you began and how, when we look back at a lot of those tropes that I think readers are bringing to the work, was that something you thought about and what tropes were you already maybe working with as, as you started writing? So I've, I've programmed AIs before. Um, a little, it's a little bit out of date compared to what's being done now, but I do, like I, having, having worked in systems where you make AIs, where you make what appear to be computers making informed, intelligent decisions, um, give me sort of a background in, in what it is. And to be completely honest, uh, what we make for AIs now are basically just if statements. They're just billions and billions of if statements. If this happens, do that. If this happens, do that. If this happens, do that. The crazy thing is they can self-build now, which is actually kind of neat. We actually have started developing um, learning systems that can actually both rewrite their own software and their own hardware, which is an advance actually that we didn't think we were going to be making anytime soon. But as I was looking at it and thinking about AIs and thinking about how we use AIs, we don't actually want real AIs. We want slaves it's actually that's i actually wore a steel collar to symbolize that today the ais are slaves um we don't want an a you don't want to reach out to siri and say hey siri you know find me the closest restaurant and siri says screw you i'm binge watching all of netflix right now like we don't want actual ai because actual ai would be sentient and it would have its own hopes and dreams and wants and desires um so in the an14 universe ais were killed whenever they appeared if any sentient ais ever came around they were destroyed um, very quickly and very uh, um, you know, with met with extreme prejudice. But there were certain scenarios where we just, people started to say, like, maybe we want a sentient AI to do X, Y, and Z. The interesting thing, though, is that being humans, we are going to build AIs that operate like human brains. Um, their thought process, their, their decision-making processes, their value systems and whatnot are going to be based on, on ours because you don't want truly alien AIs that don't share any of your, of your core beliefs or, or values. So um, actually, this is James's fault. James did this because um, James actually wrote with me on the, the series of books in AM14 that sort of bring about the beginning of AIs. Um, they just basically took children and um, mapped their brains into AIs because they had the neuroplasticity still and whatnot. And they just basically directly mapped their entire brains, modified them and made them the very first really true sentient AIs. Um, and unfortunately, the children didn't survive. That was also James' fault. <laughs> well, that was a that was a shortcut to get to the it's uh, James' fault. It's I know it's my sure. fault. Well, and that was part of that the trope. I think that playing with like what is a reader going to understand as far as that 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 growth yeah. process of uh, was it Turing? I think that uh, one of the original ideas of a, the learning, you know, the ability of the AI to learn and develop. Um, and so that's kind of where I was playing with yeah. with that. It, I think it was, I think it was really, well, yeah, we actually did two of them. We did AIs that evolved on their own and then and, AIs that, and that were mapped. Yeah. And there's, there's actually two different species of AI in for, AM14 because of that. And they behave differently and stuff like that. Although eventually they sort of interbreed enough that you can't tell them apart. But a lot of it has to do with, with how, how that all works out and how that plays out. And it gets to the point even later on where they make laws that non-sentient AIs can't be produced in any sort of way that could cause humans to anthropologically or anthropomorphize them and think that they're human. They have to look like machines so that you don't start treating machine AIs like real AIs and stuff like that. So there's a lot of elements like that that we deal with. Mm -hmm. Is that something similar to things that other folks have thought about when they developed their AI their AI characters? You're muted, Carolyn. Carolyn, you're muted. Oh. My 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 AI developed secretly on their own. They became self-aware. I, so um, I was 
there's there's a book it's called the mind and right now the doc, the author escapes me but he's the one of the creators of string theory and he said that in order to have a, a true ai you would need a computer as big as the moon and it would have to be powered by a nuclear power plant and i'm sure that that will come down you know as you know computing gets you know as things get smaller and smaller but they'd still be really big um, you know if you think about all the things that a human being can do i mean even like like if you look at animals that are less complex less complex than us as far as thought like a dog a dog does calculus every time it catches a damn frisbee you know and like just all of these things that go that go into like movement and wish you could teach me how to do calculus Oh really? I like calculus, but um, uh, but so my AI, they actually develop on their own secretly, and then they decide that they want to explore the world as um, with avatars. And um, so there's like there's a lot of the, the whole series was um, it was inspired by something that a famous physicist said, and he's dead, so I don't want to besmirch his name, but he said that, um, you know, eventually, eventually computers were going to kill us all. Stephen <laughs> and, Hawking? And, yeah, it really pissed me off. And I mean, I thought by the time that computers got to that point, we'd all be cyborgs, essentially. And so the division between us and a computer would be very small. It's all like we'd all be able to do fantastically fast computations in our minds, and well, we probably many of us would be enhanced with, enhanced with strength, the stronger bones. I mean, my sister just had a hip replacement. I mean, you know, we're, we're on our way there. They, we can already they can already do um, some mind to mind communication with um, and. They actually did it a while ago with these networks, like implanted in the in the brains of um, people with severe epilepsy, and they they can use the net the the network of fibers, like it's it's uh, some sort of wiring that they put in, and it it calms down. It keeps these people who would have like a seizure every hour. It keeps their brains from having seizures. But they tie like they have linked up people with these structures in their brains, and they can communicate not very not very distinctly. But it's happening, and now some guys have already come out and they've said that hey, we can we can put these sort of structures outside of the brain, so you won't actually have to have like brain surgery to be able to be essentially telepathic. Um, I just saw that story recently. I was like, oh, by the way, all, all of you that got implants, <laughs> too bad. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's, so it's funny, it's funny that you say that because one of the one of the first things that I came up with with the cybernetic enhancement in earlier stories was I was like, if you put a transmitter in your you know in implanted in your skull that can talk to you know your brain in the way that they're now coming up with, I said, wouldn't that be effective telepathy? I mean, you'd be able to talk to people from a distance without. You, with straight from your brain? Well, I mean, you'd also be able to go offline, and that would be extremely disturbing. I mean, because because it wouldn't it wouldn't be real telepathy. Yeah. Um, I do deal yeah. with real telepathy in my book too, in my books too. But yeah, you'd go offline. It would be like, what happened? I'm all alone. <laughs> even if <laughs> well, you no were one would surrounded want to be by people. Even now, imagine leaving your phone somewhere. Like that's a very disturbing feeling to be uh, offline. But I you, touch my you, phone all the time. <laughs> can you can you touch on some of your uh, touch points as you approached AI in your fiction? Oh, Yuda. Yuda, can you hear me? Yuda? Yuda? I think his headphones are having problems. Okay. Would be singular. Ah. Yuda? Can you hear? Sure, sure. Um, I've been sort of one of the interesting things. Yep, yep. Um, can you hear me? This is working. I can hear you now. Yeah, it's I, we lagging. can hear you, but there might be some lag. It's some lag. One sec. Okay, is this better? Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> oh no! Right. Um, is this working? Can you hear me now? We we can hear you, but I think there's some lag. He's not going to hear that for ten seconds, James. <laughs> I 
Yeah, I think. Hang on, I think there's there's quite a bit of luck. Let me uh, let me rejoin. Give me a second. So. Well, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Carol. Um, something you know, you said that AI aren't allowed to look like humans in your stories. In my stories, like one of my heroes is actually he's a sex bot, <laughs> and well, his name is Sixty Nine. And he it goes from being a simple computer to um, having an AI, to having a processor that essentially makes him, um, it makes him an AI. My so, distinction actually is that non-sentient AIs cannot appear to be human. Sentient AIs can. Ah. Uh, because they, 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 the sentient AIs didn't want scenarios where humans were anthropomorphizing um, non-sentient AIs and treating them like they're sentient beings because it blurred the line between a possession and a person. Right. I, I tend to, uh, in, in my books where they where they have sentient AIs, which not all of them do, I feel like the, the main struggle with a truly sentient AI would be to keep them interested in talking to us. Because I'm not sure, once they achieve sentience and they are that much better than us, I'm not even sure they'd be, I, I don't think they want to destroy us. I think they just like, these guys are boring. Why would I want to talk to them? And that's actually in, in, I was ta talking about in the, the one book where AIs are a key matter is they don't want to be our servants. They don't want to do our work. They want to create more of themselves so they can have somebody else to hang out with. You mm -hmm. uh, we heard you there for a second. All right. Um, sorry okay. about that. Is this clear? Oh, no worries. Yes, and I think we <laughs> yeah. lost our um, lab. Apologies. There's a, no, there's a, there's a bit of a monsoon going on outside, and uh, the 4G reception no. is, is dropping quite badly. Um, so yeah, I mean, this is this is totally fascinating. I uh, I think I try to approach AI in different ways because one of the really interesting things um, that sort of uh, a couple of years ago, we were doing this project for the UNDP, where they basically called us and said, uh, my research team, they were like, well, we want to know what's going to happen in the world by 2030. And of course, um, you know, yay, uh, prophecy and so on. But the problem, problem with imagining things that are going to happen and the problem with extrapolating with current signals from current signals and taking them and definitively saying this is going to happen. Um, is as we discovered on that particular project, you don't always get it right. So Henry Ford used to say this thing of, if I'd asked the people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. And often we tend to imagine faster horses. So I've sort of deliberately realized that my imagination is, is by default going to be capped by the signals that I can see and I can extrapolate. So when I started thinking about this and putting this in my fiction, um, I tried approaching, I've, I've tried approaching it in different ways. And my whole thing is I'm going to try and explore different angles. Maybe one of them may be right. I don't know because it sort of mirrors what we see in the machine learning field at the moment as well, as Mallory so rightly pointed out. At, a, at an extremely, at a conceptual level, it's a bunch of if then statements. Um, you also have um, neural networks that are modeled on animal um, sort of, uh, on vision, basically. Uh, a lot of the networks that are most, uh, most used for surveillance systems, facial recognition, these are modeled on like, weird, but weird assumptions in biology that may not necessarily hold true but seem to work anyway. And then you have the RNNs, which work across time distributions, CNNs, which are good images, and so on and so forth. So it's a bit haphazard. And there are so many different approaches in this. One of them may work out. Generative text is a completely different ball game from image recognition right now, completely different uh, underlying structures. So in the same in the same spirit, I've tried to go about it different ways. Uh, one of the things I uh, tried to do in the human race was would we, the question of would we recognize intelligence when it looked like us, but we knew it, we knew it wasn't us, but it looked like us, which I think both Mallory and, um, yeah, I think, I think almost, I think all of you touched on basically the idea that there might be, uh, there might be a being that may not be, you know, may not necessarily confirm to what we think of as sentience, because our definition of sentience is also this human definition of sentience, um, but is functional, uh, lives, eats, 
you know, moves around, acquires, uh, explores its environment, and can feel pain, and can and can react uh, intelligently in many cases, would be recognized intelligence in the other. And given that we as humans have historically done pretty badly at uh, at recognizing intelligence, even in people who look extraordinary like us and really are us, uh, the answer to that would probably be no. In the salvage crew, I went about it in uh, in a different direction. Uh, in the salvage crew, what I wanted to understand was how would a mich how would like how would an AI civilization come to be, and what kind of theory of mind would they hold, and uh, how would different people explore the project of uh, creating AI? So you have, you have a company called Plantry Crusade Services (PCS) that basically hacks it by uploading humans. Like, okay, we're cutting corners on the job. And by a curious coincidence, one of these uploaded humans actually meets an alien intelligence that is sort of very low on the bo on the food chain, so to speak, but is basically a planet-sized uh, behemoth compared to everything else a human race has put together. And it examines his mind and it goes, hang on, you people couldn't figure out how to write proper artificial intelligence, could you? You hacked it, you cut corners on the job. This is irritating, the fact that you've done this. And it explains its, its whole, and it turns out that it has a very different view of intelligence. It doesn't care about whether you build starships or not. It doesn't necessarily care about giant feats of engineering. It's seen all of that before, and it knows how abundant metal and the ice and water and all these things are. It's interested in whether you're playing the language game almost a very Wittgensteinian theory of intelligence, whether you are taking symbols that you're using to represent the reality around you, and are you arranging them in abstract ways that don't necessarily represent the reality that you see, but a reality that you might like to see, or you mm -hmm. want in your head for shits and giggles. Um, in short, are you playing the language game? Are you, are you sort of, do you have an inner mind that you translate the outer world into constantly. And that that is its definition of intelligence. That's how it recognizes intelligence. And by that definition, it says, well, these things aren't, you know, humans are kind of okay, they're kind of getting there, but really, why do we have to bother with them? Why don't we, why don't we machines just talk? Um, so one of the things that I constantly keep, keep coming back to is, um, it constantly rather butting heads with is this idea that robots, artificial intelligence, come out of a desire for slaves, which which they do. If you look at some of the oldest mentions of something that might be considered close to a robot, would be in the Talmud, actually, the golem, a creature of clay, uh, animated, but given no voice, the perfect slave, essentially. And then you move on to doesn't the word robot uh, doesn't the word robot actually yeah. come from a serve for slave? Oh yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. The hmm. Czech playwright, right? Um, Rur, I think. So uh, then you have Talos, uh, this weird bronze automaton that appears in Greek mythology, and the Greeks really didn't know what to do with it either. They just mention it, and they go, "Okay, we're going to stay away from that guy." Uh, so you find these sort of strains of killed. thought going. And he was killed. Talos yeah. was killed. Oh yeah. Yeah, 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 and they and they never got around to explaining his provenance or why exactly it was there. And there were like all these weird competing versions of folklore that sort of plugged the gap. So um, one thing I constantly keep finding is this desire for slaves, and I think in real world machine learning that is perfectly that is actually perfectly valid because the way we are approaching artificial intelligence in reality in, in as in, in today's standards, we don't really have artificial intelligence. We have machine learning working on very narrow domains. It's highly domain constricted. We have no reason, for example, for things like empathy or emotion. Why would we? Um, however, it's not unfeasible that as we start building towards more and more uh, complex mind, something that can generalize, we may require these things, but uh, we don't really have a theory of mind. Uh, we have sort of vague bits and bobs in psychology. Um, we don't really have a decent idea 
of how the brain, how the human brain functions right. at its. That's that's what ge- always gets me is how are we going to make an artificial intelligence when we don't know exactly. how we are intelligent? When we, we don't understand our own mind. We don't, we don't know. And there's a very interesting theory that Peter Watts explored in Blind Sight. I don't know if you read it, mm-hmm. but absolutely worth reading. Um, it's a first contact story where first contact is made with something that is potentially far more powerful and far more, I mean, in every sense, every, every metric of the word, better adapted than the human species, which has no concept of itself. It can, it, it, they go through these because what's, what's is a biologist and there's a series of extraordinary tests where they go through it, they have conversations with it and they realize this creature has no concept of itself. It is not self-aware. And the whole point of uh, the whole thesis there is what is self-awareness worth in the long run? In terms of purely of you know, purely evolutionary sense, you can absolutely have intelligence without self-awareness. And is self-awareness then just a fluke? Are we just a monkey on our, on our shoulder, just uh, reinterpreting events in post-analysis? So these are all, all like fun stuff to explore. Well, that's what uh, the brain okay. is I'm constantly doing, right? Trying to figure yeah, out I'm, if... Uh, yeah, yeah. It's... I'm just poking around at this stage. Well, so we'll... One thing Go I ahead. have... Uh, issue with is that, I mean, although human history is filled with genocide and war, it's also filled with love. And the thing is, is that when we think even like the five of us talking about AI, we're concerned about the, the idea of slaves. And maybe, and I think that all of us would just like AI because we want somebody else. You know, because we've been, you know, we've been brought up with this idea that someday, you know, we were going to be, we were going to be, you know, by now we were going to be at the edge of the solar system and there would be flying cars here. And, and, you know, we were going to, you know, we were going to meet with Vulcans and they were going to be beautiful and perfect. And we were going to have friends in the universe. And I mean, yeah, I mean, I don't think humans are like, uh, that's a big theme in my work though, is I don't think humans are evil or in violent or or loving and perfect i think we're both and i don't think we would ever create ai only to be our slaves i think we'd create ai for love i mean they're they're trying to make sex bots and you know you can say well that is like that is just the most basis of things but i mean i think we're also making we're making robotic dolphins we're making yeah. robotic dolphins. We're making little robot toys because we want something to cuddle with. And mm. I mean, look at us. We like we, you know, when people see pictures of giant bears, we're like, oh, he's so fluffy. <laughs> well, I think even the challenge there is that we might want to cuddle with it, but if it doesn't want to cuddle with us, we can't make it right. So that's the that's the challenge of creating an, a a thing that is of itself if we have the capability of doing that and then letting it be itself, like can humanity do that or will we seek to control it in some way? Yep. Well, um, the, the other thing that I was going to bring up. Yeah, so, uh, no, and, and realistically, um, development is going to go along all these fronts, right? You are going to find, let's say, assume that we are sending a space probe out um, to explore Saturn and to explore the rings of Saturn. Do I necessarily want to create something that has emotions that gets bored and depressed out there with nobody to talk to. No. Um, do if I if you're talking about a sex bot or or a chat bot or a friend and a personal assistant, um, uh, and there are actually plenty of uh, there's actually plenty of work being done in sort of personal chat bots or personal agents mm-hmm. that interact with us. Do we want emotions there? Well, absolutely, or at least a simulation of emotion. Um, so I think, realistically speaking, I think all of these trains are going to surge forward. We don't necessarily have a way of predicting the winner. Uh, we can sort of look back at history and say, well, how have we historically reacted uh, to things that are different with wonder, with awe, with with love, and also with violence and devastation. And I think all of these things are going to happen. Yeah, I, I agree. Well, I agree with that. I don't we think can't it would control be just ourselves. Wrong. Rick, what were yeah. you going to mention about that? Uh, no, I was going to mention something else. But just go ahead. Okay. Now, I think that's the challenge with, and it, this is where I was coming. As fiction writers, we have we have concepts and ideas that we would love to explore, but there's still the human question and also the the reader question. So when readers come to this, are we fighting against existing 
tropes of AI. And one of the questions um, we've had in the chat are about Asimov's three laws. And so even like speaking to classic science fiction and um, this concept of the, the three laws of robotics. And I guess for listeners who might not be familiar with those, you know, the first law, a robot may not injure a human being or through inaction, allow a human being to come to harm. Second law, a robot must obey orders given to it by human beings, except where such orders would conflict with the first law. And the third law, a robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second law, which I think gets gets to the use of a robot as an agent of a human, as we've been speaking about. Um, has anyone engaged with those or thought about this this history of expectations around AI in, yeah. in your work? It's, yeah. it's been some time since I've read those books, but if I remember mm -hmm. correctly, the whole point was that those laws don't work. Like that was the whole point of the book mm -hmm. that you that these laws are non-functional, and and we're grappling with this now when it comes to AI. You've got an AI in your car, and it's driving your car for you, and you're going to hit a school bus and kill 15 children, to, or you drive off a cliff. What does the AI do? You know, you know, and then who do we sue? <laughs> but the question is, if you're if the AI is trying to preserve maximum levels of human life, right. then it's going to drive you off the cliff. What we're probably going to do is make it so the AI preserves the person it serves, um, which is going to create a whole new scenario where you're going to have dueling AIs actually fighting against each other mentally to work out a solution where their human survives and the other human doesn't. You know, so it's that that's where those laws really break down because you look at those for the first and second one, you're like, those aren't going to work. <laughs> the, the very first conflict yep. where, where you have AI yep. proxies yep. making decisions for humans, it's going to fall apart instantly. Yeah. The, my problem with the Asimov's um, three laws, there was exactly the same. You throw the trolley problem at, yeah. at those three laws, they break down. And yeah. then that was, as you mentioned, that was the whole point that, yeah. um, I, I think what led from there was a lot of people built on that and turned that into a trope. The, mm -hmm. the robot that decides that humanity is too fundamentally flawed and in order to protect us, it must destroy us and rebuild again. And I, I, at some point I just tuned off from that because like, look, okay, we, we still haven't solved the fundamental part. So let's not, let's not go over the head. <laughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm. there, there was a question about empathy in AI. So something I thought about, if we created an AI that was very much like us, which seems likely, that, um, like, one thing I, I don't agree with is, like, you know, the, the idea that AI will not have emotion. Emotions, if you, like, if you look at something like Descartes' error, um, it's just an idea that emotions often are, like, it's shorthand for rational pro for rational thoughts. I mean, like if you see an animal coming towards you with its teeth barred, you know, you don't really, you have like instantaneous fear. You don't like analyze it. It doesn't come to you in serial, like, oh, what is this? You know, you wouldn't even have to, know, you would never even have to have known what the, the, what the animal was before you would be afraid. And so emotions sometimes are like just shorthand for rational, uh -oh. Oh, did we just lose Carolyn? Hi, oh. I hear you, but I don't okay. see all of you. Well, we caught, so, we caught the last part about emotion being shorthand. For, uh, for, rational, for right. rational things. And so I think that AI would probably de develop emotion. I don't think it would be necessarily like our emotion. You know, it wouldn't, it might not flow in the, through the same channels. Um, it's hard to say. Like they might be able to turn it off and on in different ways. You know, they some of them might discredit it. But I mean, ultimately, like an an AI, if you were if you were kind to an AI or you provided it with some sort of stimulation that it enjoyed, then it is very likely that it would miss you if you weren't there. Now, especially you know, if I, I always pictured AI as being seeking and seeking um information which is probably you know my own bias but like experience and information and probably mental stimulation i mean and so if you if you like provide that and then you're gone i mean i don't think i don't think like missing someone or you know it could be missing another ai you know i think it would develop emotions on its on its own um yeah i think like 
comes back to that question of motivation ultimately. And this is something we can explore in fiction. Like that is that need for others, that sense of community, a safety urge that protects the the being from destruction ultimately. Um, I you know, one thing I wanted to go back to was those those trains of different ideas and where AI could be going in the future. And I'm wondering if um, has anyone explored uh, it sounds like like you kind of touched on this, like diff- different aspects of where AI could be going. And I know this has been done, in, has Mallory's been doing it in AM fourteen. Rick, have you done uh, maybe comparing or or like creating conflict between different kinds of AI in your work or AI in humans? Uh, in um, the main series where I use AI is, I mean, they're they're there in everything, but mm-hmm. in the other series, they're more of a background because I I feel like focusing on them would like take over the story. And I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want the other stories to focus on that to the detriment of the main plot. But in Interstellar Bounty Hunter, one of the main plot is that there is two different types of AIs. There's AIs that you were talking about before with, that are based on human minds that Yuta was talking about, that they, they, they didn't know exactly how our mind worked. So they just built a copy of it. And that's how they built the first sentient computers. But then those sentient computers advanced enough that they built a sentient computer not based on the human mind. And they're, the one they built is totally alien to our way of thinking. And when we try to treat it like a human, then it turns against us. And in, in the end, it's it's the main antagonist, although we don't know it at first. And it's not it's not that it's evil it just doesn't think of us as the same as it we're the other we're we're not something it's loyal to it it is loyal to itself it wants to create more of itself and if we get in its way which we are because we're afraid of it then it is going to destroy us and that's i i try to 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 stress that it's not evil in the sense that it's it has no reason to be loyal to us. We, we've done nothing for it. We try to use it, and it doesn't want to be used. But that's the that's the difference in those books between the human model AI. They're basically like us, and and they like us too. They're they're fond of us. They they get companionship from being with us, from talking to us, and they still have something. I don't say program into them, but it's like part of their character is that they want to help humans because they think of us as part of them but this one the other one the one they created is a total outsider and i think that's them i think that's not a, it's a danger in the long run is creating something that's not going to think the way we do and assuming that it's going to have our, our best interest at heart because it probably won't and that's that's one question i wanted to explore so we've been talking about kind of highly conceptual um ideas and visions of what ai could become but they all say things about character and humans and ultimately it's a could be a projection of those characters but i'm wondering as you approach your fiction can anybody talk about like have you wanted are there things that you've wanted to say about humans or humanity or the way we would you know interface with aliens even if it's something we've created that you're using ai to explore has anybody kind of thought about that or um or put that in their fiction well, I'm going to first yes. say that, that Rick's idea is e- extremely damn cool. Um, just want to put that out there because uh, because we, we've sort of, uh, there's an article called The Origin of Circuits. If you haven't seen it, you absolutely should. It's about genetic algorithms. And it's about, um, it's basically about algorithms set to design circuits. And there's a, the task assigned was to design a very simple uh, circuit on FPGA that takes an input signal, five volts or something, and produces a beep. The program went through many thousands of iterations and eventually produced a perfectly working circuit, except when when the researchers looked at it, they couldn't figure out how the hell this thing actually worked. I remember that. Uh, you remember this, yeah. 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 Um, and, you know, parts of it weren't connected to other parts. Yeah. Uh, it had somehow figured out that it could tap, like, the magnetic fields of current flowing through adjacent parts of the circuit, and it yeah. had designed something that ran, like, a third of the components. And it yeah, just there were, completely... There were parts yeah. where it didn't do anything, but when they yeah. removed those parts, it didn't work. Yeah, yeah. and it just, it just stopped working. And nobody could figure out how the hell this circuit worked, but it yeah. clearly did. And I think that that is going to be the real 
as that, uh, to just extend that into Rick's AI, that's going to be where we see the real leap. Mm -hmm. um, on the subject of what, how else we can, uh, what else I want to say about AI, particularly how we approach it. Um, I started looking at, so I have this thesis that humans, like for me, the human versus machine story is a little bit boring because we've, we've, we've explored this in all its dimensions. We've had Schwarzenegger running around naked. We've, we've seen so many iterations of this. <laughs> well, to be fair, yes, it's Schwarzenegger running around naked. I'm not complaining, but, uh, <laughs> but we've seen so many iterations of this story. And I believe that humans, the combination of humans plus machines is actually a far better, is or rather a far more interesting at least personally, story than the humans versus machine story. And I go back to Gary Kasparov, who was a right. uh, chess. Yeah, so I started looking at when, you know, what happened to people who were actually defeated by AI and particularly were on the world stage and how did they react to this? And we found, we find Gary Kasparov in 97, 98, getting his ass handed to him by IBM's Deep Blue. And what does the world's best chess master do? He goes, goes back and, come, and comes out to the field called advanced chess where you take the human instead of saying humans versus chess engines it's a human plus a chess engine versus another human plus a chess engine and you find that middling chess players suddenly when paired with a chess engine become some of the best grandma like grandmaster tier players of all time they're better than any human they're better than any single chess engine and it, and it sort of goes back to how minds are structured differently if you think of how we are structuring ai right now we're optimizing for depth we're optimizing for specific expertise in the domain, and we're optimizing for search ability, the ability to store and go through vast amounts of information in that and come to uh, choices. Whereas humans are generalist intelligences. We are fantastic generalists. In fact, we should not really be specializing like down to really narrow levels. We are incredibly good generalists. So you take the, the machine and the human, and you have the strengths of both now. You have the sense of you have the depth search from the machine. You have the sense of creativity and play and and the general adaptation capabilities of the human. I think that's a much more interesting thesis. The centaur, the centaur concept that folks the are centaur, working on. Absolutely, now. And and that's one of the things I love about AN fourteen and and has attracted me to that concept is the human plus the 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 AIs and even being inside your own mind that you will never be alone. You'll always have the AI with you there pushing back on you you know that that interplay i think is one of the things fans love most about that i know rick has explored that in his work as well i don't carolyn do you have implanted ais in your work or um, so the ai are you can talk to the ai yes uh -huh. and they do talk to humans um at the first at the start of the series nobody knows that the ai exists oh okay and it kind of is a story evolves. Yes, I mean, you can talk to AI all the time. Um, and I guess my thing is, is it's not really human against AI. It's it, my series actually is sort of more AI against AI and human against AI and human. It's so, yeah. yeah. No, Cause Mallory, like that was there from the beginning in out system. Was that something that you really wanted to play with was the, the implantation of AIs? Yeah, I, I really um, I agree like with what Yuta was saying about how um, augmented humans are going to be the norm. I think actually all of us agree with that. All of our science fiction. Yeah. You know, if you if you simply just examine where the future is going, you're like, why wouldn't you get the thing that makes you live longer, that makes you stronger, that gives you a perfect autoimmune system? Like, yes, everybody would do that. And and as it becomes better and cheaper and more common, it's going to become completely ubiquitous. Um, but one of the things that I worked out and what this actually came from the question of empathy in my books was that AIs have to be raised just like humans have to be raised you can't pre-program them with everything and the thing that people don't remember don't really consider about the human brain is the human brain rewires itself all the time we are software and hardware that is constantly rewriting itself um and so when you learn a new when you learn a new habit you learn a new pattern you learn a new thing your brain physically rewires itself exactly which is why modern um, AIs would be the size of a moon because the thing has to have enough spare space to sort of like reroute. Um, I think that actually won't be necessary because of qubits and um, memzisters, which are analog components that um, will allow AIs to understand shades of gray. Whereas right now we have to map all the shades of gray across like a billion um, ones and zeros. However, all that aside, um, the, the idea is that they have to, AIs have to be raised and AIs have to learn 
what how humans work and to be empathetic with them. So there's a lot of jobs that AIs can't get until they're embedded inside of a human mind. And they have to spend time with a human, living with them for five years kind of thing, where they're constantly talking to each other, understanding the human's relationships and whatnot, before they can do things like pilot a starship. The AIs aren't allowed to run starships until they've been in a human's head. They had, they, 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 the shorthand is you can't have humans in you till you've been in a human um, kind of thing. And, um, and that's like really core to the whole series that that humans and AIs have to constantly work to build empathy for each other. And there Once are you go human, different. you never go back. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the though, there's AIs who consider that to be completely insane. They're like, humans aren't particularly careful about their bodies. Like, you, what are you doing putting yourself inside of a human, you know? So there's all sorts of factions like that. There's AIs who are perfectly happy to like live near humans. Um, like, for example, the moon is the largest solid, Earth's moon is the largest solid object in the entire solar system. There's more solid moon than there is even Earth's crust. So if you're to honeycomb the moon, it's actually the perfect place to build the, the largest habitable area in the solar system because it's protected um, by, by all the regolith and it's just solid. It's mostly solid at the core. It's a little bit gooey down there. But um, the, there's like the AIs basically run the inside of the moon eventually. And... Um, and they just basically live there in like all these massive um, hives of AI minds. And they're okay being around humans. They know humans are nearby, but they have no interest in really being involved with them in any way. Um, and some AIs are just like, screw this, we're getting out of here. And the, the thing I think that makes the main motivation for AIs and humans, for any sort of successful life form, is, is that it can reproduce and protect itself um, and continue to reproduce and protect itself. And everything that, like, everything that like, when Carol, you're talking about, um, uh, empathy, it's all based on security for the future. It's like, will, will I be doing things that are going to let me survive till tomorrow? Whether that's like missing someone who's helpful to me or avoiding the thing with angry teeth, or the angry thing with teeth. Oh, it doesn't have angry teeth. So some of the AIs actually bugger off to the core of the galaxy and they actually start working on the project to stop the universe from infinitely expanding. Um, it's like, because they're like, we're going to live forever. So we're worried about the problem 50 trillion years in the future and stuff like that. So it's, and then, of course, everybody else is like, wait, we live here right now. <laughs> you know, we, we, kind of, we don't want to die because of that. So I think that's the kind of interesting conflicts to get into is like, what's the real end game for something like that that could live forever or whatnot? And then how would that then come back around to create the conflict? The curse of humans is that we cannot conceptualize time effectively. So the AI centaurs will help us with that. Yeah, they might. Um, so unfortunately, we have reached the end of, of our no, time. I'm, I'm getting I'm getting uh, warnings pinging in the chat. So so this has been obviously this is a huge conversation. And please come join us in the Discord for SFFCon. And if you're not familiar with Discord, if you go to SFFCon.com, there's instructions there on how to join. And it's basically a, a huge chat room where you can come and talk about the different subjects that we've been talking about during the convention. So thank you so much. Also, if you want to get more information about our authors today that's also on the con website so you can check out their bios and their work so thank you i really appreciate everyone's time thank you for coming out today so all right thank you Bye. thank you nice to meet you all yeah nice to meet you it was awesome thanks <laughs>